Okay, I got a lot of notes here that I don't want to necessarily cover because uh, Larry actually covers spark plug maintenance and harnesses in uh, his class. So moving that on, um, but talking about magnetos, uh, we'll cover some stuff here on my notes, add a few things here and there. So um, inspection and maintenance. Inspection and maintenance. Uh, magnetos often call for, so mags um, may call for 100 hour, not too common, 500 hour absolutely, um, and overhaul periods. Typically speaking, you're going to do a 500 hour every 500 hour, and then you overhaul it with the overhauled engine. Um, or a lot of people just when it comes to 500 hour because the price is so close, just go for an overhauled one. Let me see. Um, every 100 hours, this is what I do. So we'll see. 100 hour, 100 hours slash annual. So I'm going to do an inspection on an aircraft for either it's the aircraft's 100 hour or the aircraft's annual inspection. Um, I check, check. Engine to magneto timing. Which in a sense is what I showed you guys tonight over in the lab. With the magneto on and you verify the timing. Well, instead of putting it on now, now you're just going to put the timing box onto the magneto and check the timing. But I usually do that after you've run the engine up and we bring it in while it's warm, start the oil draining, pull out the spark plugs, then do the mag check. Because you don't want to do a mag check when the spark plugs are in and the ignition harness hooked up. Because you are going to have to turn on the ignition switch in order to get the buzz box to work. Otherwise, the ignition switch is grounded which just causes the magneto to be off and the buzz box won't work. So the ignition switch does what to the magneto? It just grounds it. And when it grounds it, it makes the points inoperative, so to speak. They're just kind of, they can open and close all they want, but it's got another path to ground. So, so for mag when the P lead is disconnected, the magneto is on or hot or when the switch is open the magneto is on or hot all right um, check engine to mag timing um, I know a lot of people like to open up the points so open open breaker compartment and checkpoints Easier said than done on a slick. Well, it's not terrible. Slicks are different. You can pull off this rear housing and the distributor stays. And so you take this off and look down inside there. So they're very different. Uh, let's see. You can do this one. Run up. As a mechanic, hopefully you get a chance to run up a lot of aircraft, because it's kind of fun. Uh, especially, if, you know, whatever you're working on, it's fun to do. And um, so when you do a run up, even though you're not a pilot, you gotta know what to do. So, you know, doing an annual inspection, it's really common. You're working for a, a fixed base operator, FBO, um, and they say, hey, you know, uh, so-and-so just called. They want us to go start the annual. So, you know, head down to hangar number, whatever. Here's the keys to the hangar. Get the airplane out. Do the run-up. Bring it back. We'll start the annual. And so you got to go get it and do the whole run-up. So during a run-up, obviously, um, you got to let the engine warm up. You have to remember, these are air-cooled engines. And temperature variations are, are a, lot, say a, lot more, eh, a lot more than a car. Um, because the, the water in a car is pretty much held at a constant, but you never know, did with air-cooled engines. Uh, cylinders have quite a bit of choke to them, which means that 
when you get near the head, they're actually smaller at the head when they're colder. And that way when they heat up, because there's more metal around the head, they expand at a different rate and they expand more and then they'll go parallel when they get warm. So when they're cold, they're choked in quite a bit. So uh, you have to be careful. You don't want to overrun the engine. So, and they're expensive. So run up, got to warm up the engine appropriately. And then you're going to take it out and you're going to do run up. And it's usually done at 1700 RPM. So you get to 1700 RPM. We are going to do a mag drop. Mag drop. And that is where you uh, turn off one mag. Turn off one mag. So your start switch looks like it's um, off, right, left, both. So you normally you're going to run it in the both position, but to do the mag check, take it off the both, put it on the uh, left position, and you're going to see what it does. And what should it do? All right, you should see a drop of about 150 RPM. Eh, you know, it depends, but it's about that. Um, back to both. Back to both, put it back to both switch. You should see, should see a rise back to normal whatever it was a second ago. So back to 1700. All right, then we're going to go turn off. If I go to the right position, which mag is running? Right. Exactly. So turn off left mag. I uh, should see a drop. Of about how much? About 150 RPM. And we could say within 50 RPM of other mag. It's like if one was, you know, 175, uh, you should be 175 plus or minus 50. If it's 150, you should be uh, plus or minus. 150. So they, they both doing kind of the same thing is what you're looking for. They don't necessarily are going to. Some have staggered ignition. That'll have an effect. So, but for the most part, you're looking at that. So, um, and then let's say uh, go to idle and check off the off position. What should you see? Yeah. Will start to die, and then we're gonna go right back on again. All right, so we're doing this, and we go to the left position, and we get absolutely no drop at all. What does that tell you? That our left mag is not grounded. Quite possibly, yes. Left mag is possibly didn't shut off like it was supposed to, or. Which one? The right one. Exactly. Or well, the left mag wasn't running. Wait a minute, you just turned it on to the left. So, right. Yeah, right. so the right yeah. mag isn't working at all. And that's why you didn't get a drop. Because you started it on both, which is really only the left. Went to left, which is really only the left anyway. And so you get no drop. Or the left mag is just not grounding out and it's not turning off. And you are running on both. So either in this position where you're running on the left, either... Uh, right mag isn't working or the P lead's not working. So how do you know? Go back to both, see no change, go to right, and it dies. That tells you you were uh, only running on one. Yeah. Okay. Um, or you go to the uh, right and you see a 150 mag drop. That would tell me the left didn't shut off. Then I pull it back to idle and go to off and see what happens. And if it keeps running, then Definitely, the left mag isn't grounded. Or you could have a bad switch, too, where the switch doesn't work in the left position, but works in the right and the off position. Because that happens a lot, actually. Those little contacts in there wear out. So you got to be careful. The right, you said the left didn't shut off? 
Uh, okay, let me, let me run this by again. So we put it on the left, and we get no drop, which tells me either it has a bad P lead or right broken, right is dead. And the same is true if you go to the right. Either the right P lead's dead or the left is dead. Then I go to off. Oh, sorry, I did. Then I went to right. Then I went to, we'll go to right. And then I said we went to the right, and I forget what. A drop of 150 RPM. So that means that. The left P lead is working. Left P lead is working. Yeah, it would have to be because you just shut off the left or the contacts inside there are bad. So again, bad contacts. Um, but you definitely want to check that off at idle. Why do I want to check it at idle? I mean, I'm right there at 1700. Why not just check it? You don't want to inject a bunch of raw gas and have it ignite. <laughs> it goes boom. Yeah. <laughs> and you hear it from a long way away. <laughs> boom. <laughs> I've done it many times on accident to our Bonanza because it's got a broken switch. It just kind of has, it goes all over the place. It's like right, left, both, off, off, or it's off. Right, left, both, 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 start. So, I don't know, it's like, like so you have to count it, and like, then you'll lose count. And I'm like, I think it's one more click. Nope, that was off. And, it's, and then inside of the muffler, you have this uh, cone in there that's a spark arrestor cone, and it just destroys it. So then you have to buy a new exhaust. And as you can imagine, exhaust for aircraft are incredibly cheap. Um, like all the other parts. Yep, yep. Uh, so, all right. So that's our mag check. Um, so we're going to go to off. What happens if we go to off and it doesn't shut off? P lead's not working. How is it even possible that a, mechan that a pilot would not know that? I mean, don't they have to shut off their engine every time? They use the mixture control. We use a mixture control. Unless it's a Stromberg carburetor on a little cub or something. Um, antique, uh, antique, much older airplanes, small airplanes built in the 40s, you have to shut them off with the key, so they'll know. But all airplanes, 50s, 60s, and beyond, we shut them off with the mixture. So we grab the mixture, the big red knob, and we pull it back, we cut off fuel, the carburetor, and then the engine dies, then we turn the switch off. Or if you're like some pilots, and occasionally me, you pull the mixture, you get distracted, and you leave the key on for a few minutes, you go, oh shit, that's the key's on. Um, which is fine until you touch the prop and then it wants to start. Uh, all right. Skip that, skip that. Let me see. There are times when your uh, overhaul is called for special circumstances. Normally overhaul is done by calendar or hours, but you'd also need to do it when I, when I looked at, last looked it up, is every four years in service or engine overhaul. So they want you to overhaul the mags every four years. Out of 100 pilot owners, how many are going to overhaul it every four years? Zero. Absolutely zero. <laughs> because engines are the same way. Every 12 years or however many hours it is, it depends on the engine. Never, ever heard of a pilot doing it at 12 years. Um, also, uh, prop strike, which happens a lot, actually. Prop strikes happen a lot. Um, so if you have a prop strike on the engine, you're supposed to do a prop strike inspection overhaul on the magnetos for obvious reasons. They suddenly stopped. So prop strike is a sudden stoppage. If it suddenly stops, it has plastic gears in it. And that would be a good time to check it. Um, prop strike includes the engine inspection if not overhaul, correct? Say that again? With a prop strike, you've got to at least inspect if not overhaul the engine. Yeah, not overhaul, but you have to do a prop strike inspection, which you might as well do an overhaul. It's close. A complete disassembly and uh, non-destructive testing of all the bottom end parts, crankcase, con rods, pistons. It depends. There, when I first started in the industry, a prop strike, there was, the manufacturers were actually silent on it, and you'd have to go to 4313 and say, do a run out. You know the little dial thing that you use to set the end play? You just put that on the front of the crankshaft, move the crankshaft around. If it wasn't too bent, so good to go. And then the manufacturers came out and thought, man, that's maybe not the best idea because uh, crankshafts are starting to come apart. 
And so they said, any time the propeller has to be removed for maintenance due to a sudden stoppage, the engine must have a complete disassemble inspection. Uh, let's see, we can skip that. Ignition harness, spark plugs. Ignition harness. I don't think I have any good pictures of one. Throw down a pet peeve here. Ah, oh, yes. This would be the perfect picture. But no. Got to go through everything. Thank you for that. When you are working on ignition harnesses, Please, please, please use two wrenches at all times. This piece right here gets destroyed so fast. It's usually the first thing that wears out and goes bad on an ignition harness. Because what happens is this piece right here stays with the wire. This is all one piece. There's no slippage right there and it slips inside of here. So you have the, so you hold the little nut, turn the big nut, and the little nut stays put. Follow me? Mm -hmm. And so, but mechanics get really lazy, and so they just turn this nut, and so then it turns this nut, and then it rips everything apart right here, and then you have to buy a new wire because of mechanic damage, and that's just not cool. So two wrenches, all times, and you will save the wire. They also over tighten the crap out of these things. It is hand tight, you can write this down, hand tight plus one eighth turn. So are you saying move both wrenches together? Nope. When you move this wrench here, you start twisting the wire. Don't twist the wire. Mm -hmm. This is, yeah, hold still, hold still. Turn this one. <laughs> Got it? So they do, yes, they do. Okay. So hold that one still. Turn this one. Hand tight plus an eighth turn. Right. No more. Mechanics love to damage ignition harnesses by over tightening them. Well, you know why? Because this takes a seven eighths wrench. It's a giant freaking wrench. Or three quarter, depends on which size you have. So you're doing giant wrenches like, what? Well, Seven, my snap on seven eighths about that long, right? So I ah, will just put all that in there. Yeah, must be big for a reason. And uh, no, don't do that. So finger tight, eighth of a turn, you're done. They won't come off. Finger tight, got it. All right. <clears throat> got the spark plugs. We'll let Larry have the spark plugs. Now, let's see what we got here. Now we can go back through this. All right, we talked about the what? Impulse couplings. Does every magneto have an impulse coupling? No. no. Sometimes both do, sometimes only one. If only one has one, it goes on the? Left side. Which one's better, snap ring or impulse? Or a snap ring or rivet? Okay. Notice this one right here. This is the more modern style. You can see right there. That little tiny wire right there actually has a spring holding them in. So they're spring assist now. And uh, what? I've never seen it. What have, what holds what keeps this disengaged when the engine's idling? Centrifugal force. Centrifugal force pulls this part in. Okay, actually out. Sorry, this yeah. part goes out, touches right there, pulls the toe in. Actually, it's like how do you remember this is the foot and the toe? Well, because this is the ankle right here, and this is the leg, and so that's the ankle, and that must be the heel, and that must be the toe. Kind of looks like a leg to me. If not, just call it this part right there. <laughs> All right, we talked about the, what is that? Starter ring gear support. 
is the big piece, the starter ring gear is that right there. You can actually change those. It's a very interesting process. All right, those are the markings. Uh, this is called a time right. I explained that yesterday. They're pretty cool, but they're really easy to break. Uh, the problem is I've never seen one that wasn't broken. I really haven't. I, I owned one, uh, my shop did, and I was the only one that used it, and it wasn't broken because they're so weird to set up. They're just very weird to set up. So you have to get this book out, and I'll tell you. Okay, so if you're using this particular uh, engine, then you will use it, a hook that is an F hook, right? There's A, B, C, D, E, F, and that's the, the hook is this little metal part. You can't see the whole thing. And they're about that long, and they're kind of shaped like a, they'll, they'll hook up, they'll hook down, and they'll say, with the hook facing up. Well, facing up means when the scale's to the right, so with the scale to the right, you put the hook facing up, you pin it all together, but then you got to put it in the other way, and people just mess up. And what happens is this little thing right here is resting right here, and they get it going the wrong way, and the piston comes and hits it the wrong way. And instead of forcing it up like it's supposed to work, they, it forces down because you got it the wrong way. And when it forces down, it removes all of this material here. So that's what most of them look like. So the way you use it is you take your finger and you slide it halfway up and then you bring the piston through, you kind of watch how it goes and stop it before it breaks. Anyway, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you go back to the picture? Yeah. Those aren't familiar with the uh, harnesses. I took a uh, picture of that barrel and... Uh, oh yeah, right there, there's your harness. There's the big nut, small nuts just kind of hanging off down in there. All right, we talked about the... Flower pot, all right, you're gonna to get to play with that. And this is, describes how the flower pot works, but we don't need to worry about that right now. We talked about this timing mark on the uh, Continental 470s, and I explained to you why they're good, but yet they're bad. Not important right now, I'm setting you up for something. What kind of magneto is that? Bendix, 6S20 series, how many cylinders? Four cylinders. If this was a left-hand rotating magneto, and this was the number one cylinder, which one fires next? No. This one here, or this one? Because I said the one next to it. Yes. Thank you. Good job. So I said it's a left. Is it going to go this way? No. It's going to go this way. Why? Because it turns to the left this way too. So this is the. Second one to fire, third one to fire, fourth one to fire. How many times does the rotor go around to fire all of the cylinders? Once. Once. <laughs> if I had a six-cylinder Continental engine with a four-pole uh, rotor, with uh, how, then how many pole? How many lobes would I have on the cam? Four. Okay, so I got a six-cylinder. I have four. Um, what did I say? Four pole. Therefore, I'm going to have how many lobes on the cam? Four. Four. How many times does this go around to fire all cylinders? One. Follow? I can make up anything I want in this box, and the answer is always going to be the same. How many times does it go around to fire all cylinders? One. Once. It's a good trick question right there. Uh, this is the red timing marks we talked about. I showed you in class. When the red tooth is in the window, that indicates what? Indicates? Number one cylinder is ready to fire. What happens if you have the red tooth in the window but set your engine up on number three, where it's supposed to fire number three and put these two together? The outcome will be, the outcome is, it won't run. <laughs> All right, so I, sh I told you today, and you can even see right here in this one, how in the neutral position, it's off by a few degrees. How many degrees? About 10 degrees to be exact, because it likes to stay in the neutral position. And then it doesn't want to do that. So it won't stay here at the 
where it's supposed to fire, so you have to back it up 10 degrees. And then you have to, like I said, you have to put it in. You know, kind of have to think about it. You know, do I want to turn it this way or that way? But you put it in, and then so that the studs are all the way to one end, and you rotate it just a tiny bit, and beep, then it works, and then it's in the middle. Do you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, some super genius decided that they could figure out a workaround. So you buy these things, and what you do is you put the magneto right where those that it, uh, the points open, so exactly where it's supposed to open. And then you take one of those things, and you screw it in to this little hole right there, mm -hmm. and you have that nice little metal jaw comes down and it clamps on this plastic gear. Then you go fly. And <laughs> if you so much as bump this a little tiny bit, or touch the propeller, something's got to turn and you've got a piece of metal holding the plastic is holding the entire engine still. So, we, in our mag shop, I, I don't think I told you this one. Maybe I did, saw me if I did. But uh, uh, Steve, my, my mag guy, very good. Um, he did an entire set of mags for a Skymaster. That's the twin engine, one in the front, one in the back. Yep, push pull. And so, you know, it's always one of those things. You gotta get it, gotta have it, gotta have it, you know. And so he had to rush, get them all out on Friday because, you know, the pilot had to go get a hamburger somewhere. And uh, so Monday morning, as we were walking in, you know, rolling the doors, phone's ringing, Steve gets it, and he turns white. Oh my God. You know, he hangs up, and he's like, oh, that was the Skymaster mags. He's pissed off, and he's coming down here. He said the guy took a flight, and out of the four magnetos running the two engines, he made it in on one mag, one engine. So that was all that was left. I mean, he was just barely made it in. And he was at a Lodi airport, which is not the easiest airport to land at because just you have to go over the freeway and it's not real long. So anyway, he made it in. One engine landed. So this guy brings in his magnetos and I'm sure you know where I'm going with this story since we're looking at these. Uh, every single magneto was missing a tooth where the red dot was except for the one that was running, and it was leaning 45 degrees over. It was almost an NTSB investigation. So never, never use one of those. They do make one now that's, and we have them in the tool room. It's like made out of some sort of rubber, so it'll kind of hold it, but it's like, I don't know, I've got my whole life without needing it. I will tell you, okay, so. What? No. What's that? Well, it's because it's where I stole the part, the, the you know, I stole the frag, I steal the picture. Yeah. All right. Now I'll explain how this works and tell you how, and this just points to how bad that idea is. Slicks are so different. They have three holes in the back. They have the L, the R, and the X. What do you think the L hole is for? It must be the one that goes on the left side, right? No, no because it doesn't give a crap. It either rotates to the right or to the left and you stick it on. It doesn't know. So the L is for left hand rotating, R is for right hand rotating, and X is for the laser ignition systems. The, uh, they're kind of their slick start version. Uh, so if you want to uh, when you go to put this one where it's going to fire, you take a pin and you put it in here. Now you can't just drop the pin and rotate this because the finger comes around and grabs that pin that you dropped in there and bends it all the way up. Oh, I, didn't, I probably didn't put a picture in here. That's probably too bad. That's the pin. No, I didn't because I got some really good ones. And where do you think I got those pictures? I didn't steal them from the internet. I just follow a student around. So. <laughs> You put the pin in, the finger comes, it ruins the finger and bends the thing over, and then you go, I can't get the pin out. And I'm like, did you rotate the mag? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, how did it get like this, you know? All right, so you put the pin in, it takes two hands, you got to put it on a table, and you kind of work it back and forth, back and forth, and eventually, bing, the pin drops in, right? And then, now we got a piece of metal, again, sticking in a plastic gear in there, and, but, you know, I'm thinking... So then you carefully, you put it on the engine, and if you're smart, you reach up, you grab it, and you pull it out instantly. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you, 
every pin I see has got a little bend in it. So, and it's really, really easy to put a little stress on that pin. You'd be surprised. You got to put it in there. You're cramped. You're, you know, you got in there. Your, you know, hands are rubbing against somebody's safety wire and poorly cut nylon ties. You get it out. You're all bleeding. Still holding it. You got to get nuts and stuff on here before it falls off and hits the floor. And you got to buy a new mag. You're doing all that stuff. You're kind of moving it back and forth. Before you know it, you just kind of put a little stress on that. It's so easy to do. Or you're halfway done and somebody comes on the prop, what you doing? You know, it's like, well, I was timing an engine with a perfectly good mag. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's just really easy to, to move them. But that pin goes in the left hole if it's left hand rotating, goes in the right hole if it's right hand rotating in the X for laser. These holes are not equal distance from the center. They're all a different distance from the center. So behind these holes, the distributor rotor has, I don't know what that's all about. No, I didn't talk to you. Uh, has holes in the rotor in different spots. You have to line them up. And the wonderful thing is if they've been hanging around and these poor magnetos have lived in a, a school environment, these holes get really wallered out and you can actually get it a little bit sideways and you can get it, you can put it in the pin in the left hole and it'll actually go in the right one underneath and so it really is disaster. So like, I swear I did it right. And I'm like, yeah, you probably did. So, all right, so you got that. Is that the only way yeah. to find the switch? Hmm? Tell me what. Uh, you can spark it out if that's your thing. Where you actually set it on a bench and then you get the ignition harness and you set it up and then you kind of get it, you snap it and you go, okay, that one fired, which one was that? And then, don't do that. All right, so here's something that I'm going to give you a tip. You'll either understand this, go, oh, wow. Or you'll be like, I'll never understand what he just said. So you can go to those two camps. See how there's only a limited space right there? Well, sometimes I'll see a magneto and somebody's taken a file and made it a little bit bigger. <laughs> because when they put it on, it's like they went all the way to one end and it would be like 23 degrees. Ah, like, oh, damn it, I gotta take it. So I'll take it off, they're off a tooth, move it, one, two, try it again this way, and now they'll only go to like 27. They're trying to hit 25. They're like, two degrees. They're like, they can't get it right there in the middle. And so they'll just file it, make it bigger, which is completely illegal. There's a trick about gears. If you take a gear off and rotate it 180 degrees, it moves it one tooth over. Because if you follow this up, follows right there, it falls in a V. If you follow this one down, it falls right on a tooth. So if you think about it, if I had a magneto right here and I didn't move anything, but I wanted to move it over one tooth, all I have to do is take it off and rotate it and put it back on and it's exactly one tooth over. Mm -hmm. And so when you find a magneto that won't go in the middle, it's because this is on 180 off. Tricks of the trade. Tricks of the trade. I want to say in the manual that actually uses these gears, if you read it, there is something in there that tells you exactly where it's supposed to be. But that's one of the wonderful things about slick magnetos. They have a lot of range to them because you can go all the way. They don't have the little slots. They use clamps that come out on this side of it and clamp it down. But that's not the bad part about slicks. you got to have little clamps. All right, so we got that. Let's see. No. No, they're just a, I don't know. Yeah, a little piece of lumen or steel. I could draw you a picture and be like, oh, yeah. See, they're kind of square. When you look at it this way with a hole in the top, and then you look at them from the profile view, they kind of are square. Oops. Square with uh, like that. That's straight. So this part here goes to the engine, and the magneto just kind of sits right in there like that. There's the mag. That's why it's nice being in a group when you're in the engine class and you're putting it on the test stand. Because then one person can just hold the magneto yeah. while someone. Well, someone goes looks for all those parts. <laughs> all right, we talked about the D3000. Covered that in good detail, I think. Common parts are rotor, rotor, rotor. 
housing, <laughs> coupling, and cam. Spark plugs, I told you Larry to talk about spark plugs. Those are your three kinds of spark plugs. Um, unbelievably expensive, more believably expensive, and oh, it's still a lot of money. Um, I forget what these cost, about 50 bucks a piece. Is that about right? I haven't looked up the price. I think you're right, about 100. These are 35 a piece, roughly. So 100. Still two per cylinder. Still, so 100. So if you're flying around in a 310, that has how many cylinders total? <laughs> six. six on one side, six on the other. So you're flying around 12 cylinders. Yeah, 24, so it's 2,400 bucks in spark plugs. That's why I use these. They last longer. It's about a watch. Yeah. There is a hard rule. Well, okay, so I'm going to write this. But let me tell you my rules. There is an industry rule that says if you drop a spark plug once, always drop it twice. That's what they say. Drop it once, you need to drop it twice. First time it hits the ground, you pick it up. Second time you ground, it goes right in the trash. You don't question it. You don't look at it. You don't inspect it. You dropped it. It's done. Throw it away. It's uh, because the uh, porcelain breaks inside and cracks. And you can't see it. So it'll just start to fail. So I don't put it in an airplane. The other funny thing, and I don't know what this is. This is one of my huge pet peeves. These, these are called gaskets. How often, how many, how many times do you reuse a gasket? Never, never. Never, but yet in the industry, I don't say everybody does it, but it's just such common, a common practice. You just flip it around, right? It's yeah. the norm, huh? You just flip it around. Yeah, flip it around. <laughs> it's absolutely common. Oh, no, the really smart guys, they anneal them. And that data is found where? <laughs> well, everybody does it. Yeah, well, oh, I can only accept that if your dad's been in the industry for 32 years. That's my cutoff. Once you get 32, then you can do it. I, I, I was a pretty young mechanic, and uh, I, know, I got this, this, uh, this bug in my butt, and uh, I wanted to volunteer some time, so I ended up going back to uh, Ohio, and I volunteered for two weeks with this company that works on missionary aircraft and uh, the thing that I learned is so much respect for these people I mean you want to talk about doing things to perfection it's almost like Cal Fire out here um, from my perspective anyway great group of guys and gals and uh, they have a di very different way of thinking because they work on planes out in the middle of Africa or something where they can't run to the store you know like I'm over there we I'd help to build an engine and we test ran it you know we're done test running it Got to take nylon ties off and stuff. We're just holding wires. I'm just clipping them and throwing them like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like what? Like, dude, you got to cut them at the end so that you're only losing that much of the nylon tie. Then we save them. Mm. I'm like, wow, okay. And they're like, think about it, man. You know, we're out in the middle of the bush. You can't just cut a nylon. I mean, you're going to need that again. I'm like, okay, sorry. You know, you learn stuff like that. And then, you know, of course, then I got on my kick about spark plugs. We were doing spark plugs. Well, where's your new spark plug gasket? New ones? <laughs> We've got to anneal them. Do you know what anneal them where you work? I'm like, mm -mm. I didn't want to, you know, be mean about it and say, because that's not legal. But I'm thinking, hey, I guess if you're working on a plane out in the middle of, you know, um, uh, you know, BFE, yeah, it's like, well, you know, well, if that's all you got, you know, it's fly to the Phoenix scenario is what I say. So guys are, well, let me show you how to do it. And, you know, it takes a bunch of young people. Hey, I'm going to show everybody how to anneal spark plugs. And, you know, like every shop, you got a welding rod. Welding rods are this long, so it makes a loop this way. They're all full of these spark plug gaskets. And so they go, I'm going to kneel them. So, you know, you just take them and you take a rosebud, um, which, you know, torch, the settling torch, and you just you get them till they're just glowing kind of a red and just dump in a bucket of water and go, there you go. And uh, the thing I remember so much about it, though, is because he did that and he quenched it and he pulled it out really quick and then grabbed a wire in a spot that was still just beyond red hot and it. You could hear it burn in his finger. And so trying to watch this poor missionary guy not yell, fuck. 
he did. He held it together. I'm like, hmm, better than me, man. I would have been saying some nice words. These people haven't heard around here in a while. <laughs> what are the gas stations made out of? Copper. So. What are they, 10 cents? They're quite a bit more now. I buy them by a box of 100. Oh, okay. So I think I just bought a box. I want to say they're 40-some cents now. Oh, okay. So, I don't know, you know, it depends on what your license or certificate's worth to you, you know? 40 cents. If it's, yeah, if it's only worth about 40 cents, I say go ahead and kneel it. You also want to spend the $40 and send a box to those guys in Africa. I, you know, I saved them for where I was, where I saved them. What are you saving this for? I'm going to freaking save them to them. <laughs> but shipping copper, I did not do. But, uh, I, you know, that's, it, that's one of my things. I'm like, nope. Um, I do not reuse them. I don't, I don't care. If I put a spark plug in and I got to take it back out, put it back in, I just throw it away. I just don't care. You know, it's just not worth, yeah. it's not worth it. So, I know. Well, I do. I save them. So, yeah. what you, tell my wife comes to my hangar. What do you got all this for? It's copper. I'm going to recycle it. Well, are you taking it through recyclers today? No. Have you ever taken through recyclers? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have 150 pounds yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I remember that one. So, I got 150 pounds. I'm working on it. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's my thing about spark plugs. Well, I have two things about spark plugs. Thing number one is that um, I just think that's just being just being lazy and a poor mechanic. If you you can't af if you can't afford spark plug gaskets, then I don't know. Some people would argue with me. Well, it's just you know you're saving a customer money. Which way did the flat side go? Okay, I. <laughs> it's not actually. It's a not. A, it's a legitimate question. Um, on there are a lot of times when you'll be looking at gaskets and they have different surfaces on it i always put the smooth side towards the expensive part so the smooth side i put down towards the cylinder and it says somewhere in there i forget i think it's probably in the tempest manual they're much better manual um, than champion does i'll tell you that all right um might as well tell you my other major pet peeve thing oh while we're looking at this spark plugs you know they do come in different sizes and flavors so uh these are the uh, iridium or fine wire very expensive yeah i think you're right they're about a hundred and some a piece yeah don't drop those uh, massive electrode and then these are the massive i just what the heck do i call these um extended core you use these in the Lycoming O235s. All the Cessna 152s have these. And the reason why they have them is because the lead fouling is so atrocious on those aircraft. We'll talk about fuel at a, at a later time, but just know that as of right now, uh, unleaded aviation fuel has only been out on the market for about four weeks. So it does exist. I don't know where you can buy it, but we use highly leaded fuel. Uh, we call it 100 low lead. It's 100 low lead in reference to what we used to use. If we referenced our 100 low lead to leaded car gas, it would be called 100, oh my God, that's a lot of lead. Um, I wanna say it's like four times the amount of lead we ever used in car. car uh, um, and so it's got a tremendous amount of lead in it, which is, you know, got a lot of health risks. So anyway. This lead is used to bring the octane rating, if you will, all the way up. Well, now the lead becomes a problem, so they have put additives in um, to turn this lead into lead bromide. And the additives that turn the lead into lead bromide only work at a certain temperature. So if you're idling, then all this lead starts building up really bad. And so that's why you see people out there running the engine up at really high RPMs, uh, leaning it out. They're trying to get these temperatures up to burn off uh, but once the lead gets packed up inside of here, it doesn't really want to burn out too well. Um, in fact, there's a service instruction that I think came out just for the 152s with that particular engine because it's so bad. They want you to aggressively lean on the ground and bring the temp bring the RPM up and lean it before you shut down. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yep. Yeah, 0.016. 0 0.016, 0 0.018. So they're, they're all the exact same? Mm, pretty much. That's the place where I used to work. Oh, man. Just they, more expensive because it's for an aircraft. Yeah. Um, they hired a guy, uh, somebody who worked here, too, for a while. They hired him as a mechanic helper, and that was the job they trained him to do. 
And then for the next year and a half after every spark, they let them go. And then the next year and a half, every single aircraft that came in that they had ever worked on, they had to buy new spark plugs because he gapped them all the way up into the too tight. So it was beyond limits. And you can't ungap a plug. Larry will show you how, but you can't ungap a plug. <laughs> they make a tool for it that leaves marks. And it leaves marks, and when you leave marks on a plug and you have pieces of metal sticking out, that will create a hot spot. A hot spot will create an ignition point. That will create detonation that could lead to a pit system meltdown. So you have to ask yourself, is this worth the risk of melting my piston and crashing, or do I just buy the new plug? Because I was plug. I, there's two types of gappers. Um, we have one here that's the really good one, but it broke. And basically, you put it in this fixture, and it has two probes that come out. And when you squeeze it, they both go together. So you put a piece of, um, it's a tool you put in between the electrodes, um, the outer ones and the center one, and you squeeze it together and it squeezes everything together and it doesn't stress out the center core. And that's it, you just put it in, squeeze it, tool out, done. Well, those are really expensive. So I bought one and you guys will probably use that one here is where you actually have a little screw you use, and you screw it in and it comes in, it presses on one electrode, so you can't put anything in the middle because it'll stress out. And so you push it in and take it out, and there's a little spring back. And so I was doing it, and I sneezed or something, went half a turn too much. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> that one new plug. It's 35 bucks. There was 35 bucks. I, and I did. I came in, I got the little tool that we have here, and I spread it out, and I looked at it in the magnifying glass. I'm like, I just can't. I just can't. Might as well just use an old gasket now. Um, they also come in short reach and long reach. If you screw up and put a short reach in a long reach, you'll be okay. And I use the words okay very loosely. If you put a long reach in one that takes a short reach, you won't be okay because the piston will beat the hell out of the end of this. So you'll just need to buy a new plug, piston, cylinder, engine. And so don't screw that up, but you'll get into that. I'm just, you know, throwing out some stuff. They're marked. Um, this yellow right here means that it's a long reach. Um, is there but I have a Continental, and they don't mark them, so. Is there ever, like, an engine that has <coughs> some cylinders short and some long? No. Okay. If you did, you screwed no. up. Yeah, you so. screwed up. <laughs> and by the way, the threads are 18 millimeter. Standard is millimeter. Always has been. Oh, all right. This reminds me, sometimes it's those stuff. This is my good story. So the first place I worked, and I really ended up working there for well over 10 years because I really ended up loving it. We had a new owner came in. It's just a great guy to work for and changed the whole atmosphere, culture. I mean, it was all about safety, doing it right. But before that, and God bless this guy, he was, you know, Trying to always save a guy a buck. You know, he was the guy who saved these to anneal them, but never really got around to annealing them. Um, and so we got an airplane in and, uh, you know, doing the annual. And of course, you, you know, the new guy, you do the wheel bearings, you do the spark plugs, you're the one that has to clean the spark plugs. So how does he have me clean the spark plugs? Um, I'll just do my story. So you take them over and you put them in the glass bead booth and you use glass bead and you glass bead the ends real well, and you glass, and they, and they were all rusty, spark plugs, oh, you know, glass bead the outside too, you know, we'll paint them, so I glass bead the outside, inside, it's all glass beaded up, now oh, they look gorgeous, you know, but now it's bare metal, and it's, well, now you gotta paint it, all right, we'll have some paint, yeah, here's some continental gold paint, do you want me to paint them continental gold, yes, I want you to paint them continental gold, so I paint them all up continental gold, and I put them in, I probably did that for a good six months or more, until I learned two things, um, number one, this was your first one, right? yeah. Number one, this piece right here, when they come from the factory, they are perfectly round. <laughs> As they wear, they begin to look like a football. I thought that they came looking like a football because that is so wore out. So I learned that there is a gauge, you gap them and then you put, there's a gauge with a hole in it. And if, if this fits in this particular hole, then, there's the hole. So if the 
spark plug, you gap it, it says right on there, gap to 0 0.016 if plug enters scrap. So I went to a seminar and they gave these out. I'm like, holy crap. And every one we'd ever, they were all went in the hole. So that made him mad that I've had this thing. He wanted to take it away from me. Well, these are bad, these are bad. Um, so anyway, I learned that those are round when they are new. And when they get really wore out, they look like a football. The other thing I learned, what can you tell about the colors of these? The gold ones are... Uh, no. Gold is fine wire. Silver is massive. The price difference is only about $75 a plug. So he had me paint them all gold. I don't know why. <laughs> I think it was just because that's all we had is paint. He's trying to be a nice guy. But that's a color coding to tell you what spark plug this is. So, and... The third thing I have, so I don't have a problem painting them. She's the right color. All right, and the next thing I learned, which is critical, and this really isn't something that, it was just kind of one of those things. When you clean spark plugs, you're supposed to blast the end. So you use a vibrator, and you stick the vibrator in there, and you break out all of that nasty uh, lead bromide material that's in there. It's all grayish brown. Um, you can see it on an airplane. If you ever see white streaks on an airplane near the exhaust, that's just that, that lead bromide. So you get all these clinkers down in there, and uh, you got to vibrate. The, this plug's terrible. It's oil fouled, but um, we'll find one that isn't oil fouled. No, it's all oil fouled, but imagine that not oil fouled. So you vibrate all that stuff out, then you put it in a blaster, and Champion was the only book we had because Champion was the only person making these plugs. Said, yeah, you put them in and you blast it with our Champion uh, spark plug media. Well, of course you want me to do that, right? Um, then it was Tempest who came out with their plug and they had a really good manual and they actually explained don't ever, ever use glass bead on a uh, spark plug because way up inside of the spark plug where the metal and the porcelain start coming together, the, the proper media is too big to get caught up in there but glass bead is so small, it packs up in there and you can't get it out. It does come out. When you put it in the engine and screw it into the top spark plug and start it up, it rains out. So you fill glass bead inside of your engine. But yet, I tell you, I'll tell you right now, probably 50, I don't know, there's a huge percentage of mechanics out there who just, ah, glass, man, you just use glass, it's fine. Yes, it'll be fine. I've never, I've never had a problem doing this for 30 years, so. Anyway, so I never use the wrong media. You'd be surprised how really inexpensive it is to do something the right way. Like, I don't, you know, I, I have my own airplane. I want to clean my own spark plugs. So I went on, like, Amazon, and you can buy these old, actually, Larry bought a bunch. You guys are using them. These little handheld spark plug cleaners, they're only, I think, like 20 bucks or something. Um, they work really, really well. And, they buy, and you buy the, the right media. So. It's, uh, I don't know exactly what it is. It's a pretty harsh grit, uh, but it's a large, it's a large grit. It's not walnut. It's, it's harsher than walnut. I have stuck my finger in there and pushed the button and it hurt really bad. So that's what we're going to, okay, break time.